This conference will now be recorded. Okay, now we're ready to go. Today's topic is, is this the best of both worlds? Cover crops and forage? And it's, a, it's, a, it's well, again, one of those topics that every once in a while people ask me about, you know, to do a, a topic and so forth. And, um, and I'll just be straight up front that this is not a topic that I'm intimately familiar with, although the picture you see in the background is indeed my farm where we ran my neighbor's cattle over beef herd, uh, about 80 head total, and we grazed them on uh, different species of cover crops. You can kind of see them in the background. Uh, so uh, this is this is something I'm working with my neighbor on. I don't have cattle yet. It is being discussed. Uh, we did put uh, two new gates in the border fence between my neighbor and I. Uh, this year we had uh, pretty good yields and forage. And when I asked him about bringing his cattle over to my fields, he thought he had enough forage. So uh, we didn't bring them over this fall, which maybe is not that bad of a thing because we were very very wet. Uh, so. I'll just say that's uh, been my experience. Other than that, I uh, do grow forage for animals, uh, cover crops slash forage for my neighbors where we will cut it and, and bale it for high moisture uh, for uh, dairy farmers who need it during the winter time when uh, the grazing options are somewhat limited. So that's my <clears throat> that's my background. But I got to say the first person that came to my mind to be able to help me out with this is our special guest today, Monty Bottens. Uh, and uh, those of you who are on before, you saw a little bit of live video uh, from that. But um, I'm just going to say that I've known Monty for, it's almost 20 years now, I believe, uh, Monty. I first met you in 1999 in California when you were, um, I'm thinking the crop consultant was your title there. And um and we have kind of kept up over the years. I've been to your farm there in Illinois as, as well and uh, did some presentations there. So I thought, Monty, we would just start out. Uh, you would uh, just, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us what we should know about your background. I'll just say, and, and this is why I think Monty brings such a good expertise here is Monty was I think this is correct in saying, Monty, you were a pretty hardcore cash grain farmer. And now I think you're a pretty hardcore uh, grazer and having animals on that same land that grew corn and soybeans. So tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll go into some of the presentation. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, appreciate having the opportunity to kind of uh, share some of the work we're doing to mm -hmm. get more value out of the land and be able to improve land uh, quicker. Uh, so that's the two main objectives we're trying to accomplish here. Our uh, family farm, uh, great great grandparents settled here on my mom's side in 1869. Uh, my dad is from more down by the Springfield area and then my dad started farming up here, bought 80 acres in 74. Uh, we had a couple, we worked at a Case IH dealership which uh, eventually took me to California to run a Case IH dealership there. Fell in love with California and uh, started seeing the need to adopt some no-till and minimum tillage techniques in California from the Midwest, but adopting it within the local context of irrigation and no rainfall. So that was the beginning of California Ag Solutions. Um, we started that business in 04. And then um, after that, uh, that grew into our own line of uh, specialty products and biologicals that we began marketing through the Western United States, uh, from Montana to Arizona and Kansas to California. And that company is known as Ag Solutions Network. Um, and then uh, out of that, it allowed me an opportunity to move back home here about five years ago and be a, a part of the farm again. And just been really watching and following the regenerative agriculture movement and think there's some solid uh, experience and science there. And saw a need to figure out how to make that scale um, because if, if it's true, the principles are true, which the science backs up, that we can do some amazing things both ecologically and economically with regenerative agriculture, we need to do it on more than a 40 acre basis. You know, we need to do this on tens of thousands of acres. So how do we adapt that typically hobby and or uh, small farmstead uh, 
movement to uh, larger um, family farms uh, and allow it to be a uh, area of profitability for them in the face of three and 380 corn, whatever it is, um, and and be able to uh, prosper and also prosper the soil at the same time and provide people food that they want. I call it the Netflix effect. You know, if Netflix is going to create it, let's supply it. So um, we're happy to do that. And that's where Grateful Graze came from. Um, we raise the animals as part of our family farm and then we sell it to Grateful Graze. Uh, that way, if somebody has a raw chicken on their countertop and they slap our hamburger on top of that chicken juice and decide to go to the hospital, they don't blame us and we lose our whole farm. So there's that's a purpose of that's a stopgap. And then also the purpose of it is, is to be able to integrate with other farmers in the area, teach them these techniques and provide a marketing source for them. So, uh, you know, having a family name on that uh, isn't conducive to being able to accomplish that goal. So. It's just a matter of kind of where, where God leads, I go, and where you meet great people and you see what they're doing. You try to uh, implement that into your own situation and, and think about how other people could do it um, in a broader context in order to basically affect change quicker um, and, and greater. And to do all this, it requires a tremendous team of talent. Uh, here at the farm, we've got uh, Ryan East, a friend of mine from California that moved here. Uh, he is basically does everything researching the cover crop mixes and planting them and he has a lot of knowledge in health and welfare of the animals. We've got Cole Peterson. Uh, he's basically our herdsman, does every day to day moving and checking of the animals. He's going to college right now. And then we also have uh, Alyssa Bradley, his fiance. She's helping with the marketing side. And then fortunately, we've got our home office team that helps us with accounting and regulations and licensing and all this other stuff. And then, of course, we got my dad uh, that's willing to put up with my nonsense. So he said, you can do all the livestock you want. He says, I just don't want to do it myself. So uh, there you go. But we're, we're incorporating livestock as part of a crop rotation. Um, you know, just it's another, yeah. another use for the land. So mm -hmm. that's the background of where we're yeah. at. And, well, that's uh, we're having a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. That's great, uh, Monty. And for those of you joining here, uh, I would just vouch for that. I've, I've seen Monty's farm. I've seen him in California. I've seen him in Illinois. We've seen each other at conferences. I spoke at several of his meetings. And um, I, I just think one of the things you just said here that I really liked, how to scale regenerative agriculture. And I really appreciate your role in doing that because you have the background that gives you credibility. Uh, that, that in, in doing that. So um, I'm going to be advancing through these pictures, Monty. You can comment on them. The, the timing is going to be a little erratic. My internet speed seems to be really, really slow today. I'm going to try to to keep up or, or whatever, but um, just talk us through these pictures, what you see now, what is it, and then we'll just kind of walk through that. So what we have here is this is uh, basically a cereal rye barley triticale mix planted in the fall. That's about April 20th this year. We had a very cold spring, so we didn't get much growth. But there we've got the, I believe that's the white herd. My screen's a little small that we got in from um, Gabe, and that was their first day out. Uh, so we grazed that with corn stalks, uh, and they're grazing on the uh, green covers. And then we come back and plant that um, no-till plant right into that uh, about 10 days later. Soybean. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got uh, the next picture coming up here of a series of, yep. series of slides mainly doing with your cash cropping. So set, let us know a little bit about the cash cropping and then, then we'll finish. We'll kind of the, the back half will be about the, the forage aspect and the grazing everything. So. So what we have um, I'm curious. Is, uh, I, 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 go ahead. So I'm planting corn here in this picture, and uh, we went to this configuration uh, three years ago based on observations of how well the uh, – we realized that where we're at in a little more northern latitude, we're 41 north, and um, we need to let that crop grow as much as possible. So if we, we terminate ahead of planting, we have to terminate two weeks ahead of planting to avoid the cheese effect. Uh, from cover crops where it just turns mucky and doesn't dry out uh, and get it dead or leave it green and plant. So here we're planting corn and there's three rows of uh, rye, barley, triticale mix there and then there's a skip row. And that was planted with a 40 foot cedar with GPS 
And then I come back with a 60 foot planner with GPS, uh, both have GPS steering systems. And, um, you know, this is the flattest spot on our farm. So it takes the best pictures, you know, so you got to always have the glamour shot, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, so that corn row will go right in those gaps that you can see there on the screen. Yeah, the next picture coming up here is one of your planters. Um, I got to trigger this a little sooner. Uh, but uh, any special setups in your planter to plant through stuff like this? Well, this is uh, version 18 here. It's a Harvest International planter. Um, we got the full um, precision planting tchotchkes. Uh, then we have onboard info. Uh, products from our company that we manufacture and then uh, we have B um, B apply HD love that system along with the furrow jets where we're putting some PNK beside the seed and then we dribble nitrogen and sulfur on the surface so we're applying three different nutrient mixes in five locations all variable rate um, and all speed controlled here is uh, after we plant this has been a grazed area so we've grazed it and then we plant right through it. We just use a Martin floating residue managers with clean sweep to, to sweep to the side. And this would have been uh, soybeans planted here uh, between now standing rye barley triticale mix. There was some Austrian peas so, um, in the batch, but they didn't survive. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm assuming not, I don't want to jump ahead here, but you'll be monitoring your fertility levels and, and everything in the context of cattle. So, um, maybe you want to speak into that a little bit. What are you expecting? You're, you're in a, you know, in the front edge of this. Uh, what are you expecting? What are you doing right now? Anticipating a change in fertility, but potentially. Well, we, we did full, um, complete soil audit on all of our acres. So we did uh, soil testing by management okay. zones or soil types along with Haney tests mm -hmm. uh, everywhere mm -hmm. ahead of time. And we'll continue to do that uh, per rotation. Um, this photo here mm -hmm. is planting into, um, if you look in the foreground here is where it's been grazed and recovered a little bit. And then where the planter is at is where it was not grazed. So one of the benefits we're seeing the grazing is sometimes we can get that headed out cover crop that's just too much jungle to deal with and can shade out light. Mm -hmm but the grazing uh, keeps it more vegetative as it's regrowing and you don't lignify as much. So therefore it falls down mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't complete with light as much. So we, um, I got the yield mass, but it looks like we gained a couple bushels of soybeans uh, east versus west here uh, just from grazing. So we got free forage and gained a couple oh. bushels at the same time. This so you're already is, seeing. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Steve. No, I'm just saying, so you're already seeing uh, a little, we'll just say a yield bump or a little influence. Right. And if I have that really headed out jungle, you know, head high stuff, mm -hmm. if I roll it, I can get seven bushels. But if I can prevent mm -hmm. it from getting into that jungle um, mat mm -hmm. by either grazing or terminating earlier, uh, we see an, an, a yield mm -hmm. advantage in our location. Mm -hmm. This here is yeah. no-till corn yep. into uh, summer uh, we had wheat last year and then we planted a summer grazing mix and this is one little triangle that I purposely did not graze or we didn't get to or Ryan left I believe here next to the road so you know God and everybody can see it and then uh, we just no-till <laughs> planted right into that it was a mess and it came up looked beautiful I uh, just ran the combine through there I did not notice any yield drag and I you know, we've talked about it before in other webinars. Planter nutrition is critical when you want to do high biomass cover crops. And uh, that uh, mm -hmm. I was really pleased how that worked out because I was scared going through that. <laughs> yeah, you're not the only one that's scared to do some of this new stuff. But, uh, you know, if you don't really try, you'll never really know. And and, and the key here, Monty, is just, just a small area. Uh, now you can uh, maybe build upon that if you if you like what you see. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk is, about this you always, picture. Yeah, you always learn the most uh, with mistakes. And uh, what we had going on here is I had the planter configured for 60 inch rows on our uh, fertility, and I'd forgot to shut off the 30 inch rows in the monitor. So that's just a nice mm. demonstration of what uh, you know onboard planter nutrition can do. And it was really mm -hmm. funny when we went to harvest this, almost everything in that row, uh, the 30 inch row without nutrition was flat. 
and uh, the others were really? um, were standing. So that that was interesting. It's just a mistake, and it, it makes for a nice dramatic, you know, picture of what were going on. Because normally most fertilizer uh, or herbicides are applied to an entire field, you know, and you sometimes yes. you see those spots where you miss with the herbicide, and it's like, oh, the corn's a foot taller, but there's weeds in it, huh? You know, is it the weeds or was it the herbicide that knocked it back? And, you know, and here's the situation there. Mm -hmm. This is some of our 30, 60 yeah. inch row comparison. One thing to note here is uh, this was jungle rye the previous year. Notice the rye stubble that's still in place uh, from the previous crop soybeans. So I, I found that rather mm -hmm. interesting how much, uh, how persistent that mat was. And in fact, I found that there was a yield drag associated with that. So where we had triticale, okay. we did not have a yield drag, but where we had the rye, we had a yield drag with that heavy mat. So if you're going for jungle. Any, any theories? Uh, okay. Digestibility of the forage. Uh, you got less mat that you're dealing with, uh, you know, less lignification. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That was my, so what, that was how did that 60-inch corn work out? Uh, it worked out okay. We got it planted and everything. I will say that uh, when you're dropping that many seeds, you know, in a line, that's the equivalent of driving 10 mile an hour instead of 5 mile an hour. I think uh, speed tube mm. technology would be would be good for placing it more accurately. Mm. I had more, a few more plants plant variances. Um, here's Ryan mm. and, and me out doing some ear counts on 60 inch rows. I would say, if anything, some, some treatments were equal, some are drag on the 60s, and I would say that has more to mm -hmm. do with my uh, planter equipment and skills than the 60-inch. We're not going to give it up, but we're not going to put the whole farm into it next year, but um, I see mm -hmm. there's opportunities sure. for revenue with 60s. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, 60-inch 60 60 inch corn or some other variants of wide row corn is getting a little attention now. Um, and I don't want to get ahead of you here, but uh, one of the reasons is it, gives, it opens up the potential to do some interseeding that an interseeder uh, crop would really uh, go. So what are we looking at here now? Uh, this is what uh, Ryan calls our interweeder seeder. And uh, uh, <laughs> my dad, Gary, and Ryan built this rig. We took the Valmar off of our um, CCS that used to plant the winter kill rows. We just found we never got mm -hmm. enough growth out of those winter kill rows to justify having it. So we took that air box off the, the 1990 and put it on this old John Deere cultivator bar. And those are uh, duo or um, oh, Dawn uh, whatever units. Mm -hmm. uh, duo and, seed. Uh, what's that? Duo seed, I think yeah, they call it. Seed. There you go. And um, yeah. anyway, they did that. And my dad was saying, he's like, and all these years we spent killing weeds, now you're hell, you're going out there and planting them. So um, we did that. Uh, we it got together at the last minute. We had, I think, we planted a little too deep and planted a little too late, mm -hmm. and we didn't get the success that we were hoping for out of that. But we intend to mm -hmm. uh, expand upon that quite a bit next year. So this is the beginning. Hey, just, of just before we, before we, yeah, Bob, Monty, before we go on to this, this is a transition point here. I'd like to ask. If, Anybody has questions on uh, what Monty has shared, primarily with his cash cropping operations? We're going to get into the the project moo or the the forage aspect of it here. But who would have a question for Monty right now, uh, based on his you know presentation so far with his cash crop, 60 inch corn, fertility, all that stuff? Is there any questions out there or comments from anybody? Um, just just kind of curious. Go ahead, Lloyd. Yeah. Uh, uh, he said he's planting multiple small grains, triticale, rye, et cetera. Uh, what's the logic of the multi varieties, barley and whatnot? Uh, has everything to do with uh, microbial associations. Uh, if you have one species, you'll have one microbial group. If you have two species, you'll have one microbial group for each species that you plant. And then you'll have a third microbial group that's an interrelated microbial group and then when you go to three species you have one two three then you have two two groups for in between and one so you go to six microbial groups and it just you get a multiplication effect you go to four you wind up with i i can't remember off the top of my head 12 association groups 
so what you wind up with is a much greater uh, biological diversity in the soil uh, and um, be able to basically help switch the microbial community away from this um, monoculture that we've gotten into. Yeah, I'm stepping yeah. towards that direction, but I, uh, uh, when asked, I, I, I have no idea how to explain it other than, you know, one is good, two is better, three is better yet, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there is actual mm -hmm. research behind that uh, done at, Steve will know where that was done. Uh, it was out east um, showing those uh, mm. microbiomes associated with uh, diverse cover crop mixes. So. Yeah, I can't can't come up with it right now, Monty. But uh, that that's what that's that is beginning now to be further researched. And you know what's interesting is some of these things. Uh, a lot of it were farmers that noticed what was going on, but we didn't understand it. And and uh, now I think the research community is like catching up and trying to figure this out, which is great because that will help us be able to manage. Uh, what we have at our on our you know what we have availability to manage better and um, so this whole mycorrhizal the fungi and microbes that is a whole world uh, that we really don't know much about and uh, think, no no question about it gonna hear more I think, soon I think I remember who it was um, I think Jim White out of Rutgers University has been doing a lot of work mm. on the microbiome okay. and microphagy uh, he's. I just landed him as okay. one of our speakers at Ag Emerge, but uh, he he's oh, discovered good. that the microbes in the soil, you know, affect the infect the plants and uh, can upregulate mm -hmm. or downregulate certain genetic expression. So, the more mm -hmm. diversity uh, that you can get within the plant, the more opportunity for genetic expression you get within the plant. So it's some pretty pioneering yep. work and uh, pretty. Pretty excited to hear him him talk. He really hasn't had a public yeah. stage yet, so that'll be good to get him out there okay. for the activity. Anybody else have a quick question before we move on more into the the grazing and the forage part? Anybody? Okay, what are we looking at here, Monty? Well, this was the beginning of Project Moo. Um, last spring, we planted, or the previous fall, I planted uh, tritic forage triticale. Uh, blend out there, uh, and I borrowed the 16 pairs from the neighbors. And Ryan researched all the fencing options. We we came up with some mobile watering solutions because we had no power, no well, nothing, no fences, and uh, we mm -hmm. put everything in temporary and got it started. And uh, when we when we didn't kill any of the neighbors' cattle and we saw how it was working, we thought, eh, why not get some get some of our, steers of our own? So uh, we did that, and uh, um, it's kind of grown from there. But you can see yeah, that the well, clear, I, uh, clear line where they graze where they haven't. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the next picture here is probably some of the cattle you got from Gabe Brown, I'm assuming. Yep, and that's uh, about a quarter mile from here. I'm looking at it right now this spring where we've got, uh, <laughs> you know, headed out rye, but it hasn't flowered yet. And uh, that's where they're they're grazing in that. Um, right there. There's also some understory that Ryan had planted uh, down there for them to, to graze on too as far as um, you know some brassicas and, and those kind of things. When it heads out they kind of eat the leaves and ignore the rest and they stick their heads down and eat. This is our mobile shade solution because mm -hmm. everything we're doing is on crop land. There's no trees for them to get out of the 90 to upper 90s heat and humidity. So we have three of these uh, mobile shade units that provide that, and it also can utilize as a mineral, a mobile mineral solution too, because we we move our animals every day. I thought it was. So. Yeah. We. we I, I thought a UFO up, landed or something. Right. No, we uh, we want to move our animals every day so they don't track up the field because we're no till. Uh, we don't want to have mm -hmm. to go in and and till up where they've made a mess and uh, give them a balanced diet every day. This is grazing on uh, here that millet mix, uh, prussic acid millet mix to pre-frost, um, and just um, that was we were pre-grazing it a little bit and then let it grew back um, in order to stockpile graze or basically graze it uh, here in the winter. And this is here just recently post-frost, or excuse me, that's last 
last fall where we had a 160 acre field of wheat and half the field we double cropped to soybeans and I'm harvesting soybeans right here alongside the Herefords uh, were in a summer grazing mix. So that's a sorghum based 12 uh, way mix there on the hillside. So I used our flat ground, 80 acres of flat ground for the beans and I used 80 acres of mountains uh, for the <laughs> grazing and then Ryan would move them around on on that field um, to graze those hillsides and um, you know this of course wasn't straight rows so it was a lot of turning involved to plant these two different crops but we wound up getting 35 bushel beans double crop uh, normally get zero mm -hmm. and then um, mm -hmm. on the beef got some good gain out of them here's recently we've uh, switched to uh, bale feeding we've tried setting a bale in the field where you lose about 50 percent we've tried uh, hustler where you lay out a line you lose probably 30 percent um, we got these bale wagons that we're putting in the pasture right now uh, so they can graze between bale and and forage and that seems to be working pretty well less waste are you buying this hay in or do you bale it yourself no that's a nice part about cover crops uh, thanks for asking um, because we had 60 mm -hmm. acres right across the way that had gone to, you know, dough stage and we bailed that and then came back and planted soybeans into it. So it's, that's a good way to remove okay. that jungle, uh, covers too, um, mm -hmm. in order to get better soybean yields. This yeah, is I've got a, a question what, here. Uh, just, just to pause a little bit, Monty, I got a question here from Eon. Eon's from, uh, from Great Britain. Uh, what do you mean by prussic acid mix? Oh, um, sorghum and and its derivatives, sorghum sedan grass, uh, you know, sedan grass, those kind of things, and a, a couple other species, they produce prussic acid when they're frosted. And prussic acid is a, another fancy name for cyanide. And if you let <laughs> ruminants graze on that, or even monogastrics, uh, but ruminants, especially if they graze it, uh, it only takes about 15 minutes and they'll actually suffocate and die. So you have to uh, plan your management accordingly to where when you get a frost, you have some place that you can move them into. And that's why we planted this millet, which isn't or is very, very low prussic acid content. So they can graze in here until 10 days after a killing frost when all of the cyanide is essentially dissipated to the atmosphere then we can go back mm -hmm. and graze the sorghum standing uh, just basically a standing hay well i got a question on that monty because here where i'm at in southeastern pennsylvania i think without counting up we've had about eight to ten scattered frost we have not had a killing frost yet where everything's dead but my cover crops of sorghum sudan are kind of shriveled up they're kind of burnt back they're not quite dead so if i was grazing uh would this kick into play or do they have to be actually totally winter killed frozen out so there's there's a lot of a lot of opinions on this and there's very little okay you know, Good research on it and there's a lot of uh, the it depends factor so the, mm -hmm. the singeing frost that kills the leaves you know that's mm -hmm. a major source that vegetative portion is the is the major source of the uh, prussic acid and um, okay so that'll gas off and be done but the thing I was worried about is I still had green stems and you probably have mm -hmm. green stems too and Yep. What yes. is the likelihood of that green stem causing a problem? So mm -hmm. rather than risk it, because I knew I'm going to have to hay feed sometime in the future, I went ahead and started hay bale feeding them uh, on the millet pasture in order to um, buy time until I get my um, killing frost. And then after that, mm -hmm. we can go 10 days after that killing frost back in. Now, mm -hmm. could I probably, because I have a mixture of crops, you know, and it's been a long time, could you probably go ahead and graze that? Probably. Can you hay it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hay it, chop it, whatever. And that'll give you by that mm -hmm. time to gas off uh, the cyanide. Mm -hmm. But I, I just didn't okay. want to come out here and see four toes in the air. 
right? Yep. No, it's this is this is the nuances that have to be learned, uh, you know, about a new practice. And you know, the old timers probably have known this forever, but we've lost some of this information. And uh, that's just that's just good to know. What are we looking at here? It's snowing, uh, light snow there, and your cattle out there eating. Uh, what what are we looking at there? One final thing on the on the prussic acid is that planning is really important. So we're, we our pastures are divided by a creek. So Ryan planted a a portion of one side of the creek to the prussic acid free mix, and the other side, and then it's in the middle. So that way, if we had a if we were grazing along either side of this, and we came up with the frost, we could just quick switch the fence and move them into mm -hmm. safety. So mm -hmm. you don't want to plant it in yeah. one quarter. And then get a frost at night and be driving them a half mile back um, because they eat on the way and just whatever they eat on the way could could cause problems. So planning, mm -hmm. planning, okay. planning. This here, this yep. photo of the windbreak is last December. We had, uh, you know, we have no windbreaks uh, in our cropland fields. So we took some hay bales that we were feeding and set them up in the direction of the wind. We had a quote unquote hurricane for Illinois. You know, I got down to um, yeah. minus 17, and um, we had some probably 30, 40 mile an hour winds. It's it's no means a Great Plains hurricane, but we didn't want our cattle drifting and right through the hot wire. So we just set our bales yeah. up in a row to create a windbreak, and they maybe hung around there on some of the coldest days, but quite frankly, they don't care. So yeah, tell us about Grateful Graze. So Grateful Graze is an online um, store where you can order um, everything that we have by the cut. And we deliver, we have pickup locations right now. And in about a month, we'll have a delivery process where we'll deliver to the door. We're currently selling at farmer's markets uh, as a way to get our customer base started. But uh, that's... Uh, Grateful Graze buys the animal in the field um, at, at field weight. The farm delivers to the processor, and then Grateful Graze pays the processing and, and pays for the, the pickup and has a freezer and then, you know, uh, the mobile market and the online website to, to make that all happen. So right now we're just offering grass-fed beef. We've got uh, grass-fed lamb in the works and hope to have uh, poultry products next year. And if we really get crazy, we might even have pork. Wow. Well, we'll have yeah. pork for 20. Well, that's, yep. Well, that's, you know, you opened up here by saying you want to get more value out of the land. And this certainly applies directly to that. So, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I wanted to give Monty also a little time here to promote a, a, a big meeting coming up this winter uh, that uh, those who are really, really interested in some of these things. So tell us about Ag Emerge. Well, it, in, in some of the things that, that we get to do both with, with my farmer hat on and then also with, um, you know, trying to a lot of the great people you get to bump into such as you know yourself and the Gabe Browns of the world and then also Jonathan Lundgren or this Jim White and and Melissa Brandow she's the person that founded her dog and other people have got a lot of great ideas but a lot of things exist in silos and um, mm -hmm. we just really need a way to break those silos down and have everybody collaborate on what the next paradigm of agriculture looks like and um, how do we bring modern technology to soil health principles and um, the, the third group that we have there outside of farmers and, and big thinkers is going to be entrepreneurs um, what we have found is uh, we've mm -hmm. had an opportunity to do some investing in ag tech startup companies and they really lack um, context and interaction with these big thinkers and farmers and they're all working today on how to just make what we're currently doing with the current production model a little bit better a little more efficient a little bit easier and we really need to get these uh, entrepreneurs looking at making uh, technologies for regenerative agriculture type of approaches versus conventional agriculture approaches uh, in order to assist mm -hmm. in that scaling 
that I'd really like to see. So Ag Emerge is, is a unique conference that's going to bring together those entrepreneurs, those thought leaders, and innovative farmers all together um, and uh, uh, with the hopes of, of helping propel a new ag paradigm. So it's in Monterey here for a couple days. The first day is going to be, um, Gabe is going to be our headline speaker. And then after that, we're going to have uh, 10, um, what we call Ag Emerge Talks. They're going to be related, uh, similar to like a TED Talk. You've got 17 minutes to make your point. And uh, then if you yeah. like what that person has to say and you want to follow up with them, they're doing a one-hour breakout session the following day. If it's something that you have no mm -hmm. interest in, you can pick and choose whatever you want. And then uh, the third part of that day is Shark Tank for Ag. We're going to have uh, 10 different startup <laughs> companies that pitch you. And we'll have a panel of investor judges that will count for half the vote. And then you as an attendee will count for the other half. Uh, you'll be given some monopoly money that you can, you know, put in a, a jar at each Ooh. one of the little booths in a trade show type setting and interact with that entrepreneur. You can provide thoughtful insights and ideas to help that entrepreneur uh, be better and uh, better perfect their product or service and possibly be a pilot for them. Uh, a lot of these entrepreneurs need people to work with with practical experience and um, mm -hmm. so it's going to be a great time of networking uh, collaboration and, and really getting an idea of where you're going to take your farm to the next level and how you're going to do that yeah well that's that's awesome and, and i want to clarify here one thing it's monterey california okay yeah, so not, not january monterey, 9th Mexico. 11th what right but 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 anyway, Monterey, California. Where would where would the weather be any nicer in January, right, Monty? I mean, well, it, you know, it's, that, it's, that's it's a, pretty much sixty degrees there all year round. So uh, yeah, sixty degrees so, will feel pretty um, warm in uh, January. <laughs> it will. So agemerge.com. Uh, if you want more information, you, as you can tell, uh, this is a very comprehensive, very well thought out conference for those who are interested in this. But let's just maybe back up a second. Uh, questions. Uh, what are some practical questions you may have regarding the grazing aspect here? Uh, what what some clarifications or, or comments that you would like to make? Uh, just turn your mic on or put in a, right in the chat a question you have. So who, who has a question for Monty regarding the some of the things he talked about in grazing? Are there any comments? I see Eric's on from South Dakota. I know South Dakota has a lot of cattle. I don't know, Eric, if you want to chime in at all, if you could. Wouldn't mind hearing some of your perspective, what you think. You're good, Eric. I can hear you. Yeah. It is a little hard to hear you, though. Okay. Eric, could you talk a little closer to the mic or? I can try. Maybe turn it up a little bit. Does that help you? Okay. It's a little difficult to hear. Maybe try it once more. All right. Are you able hear. to try again? Yeah, this mic is Okay. Good. Ian had a question okay. on there in, in the meantime, Steve. He says, Is anyone working with sheep yeah. cover crops in the US? Uh I am. Uh, there's uh there's several go, people in their go ahead, go ahead. Okay, there's several people in the regenerative ag space that are doing that. I know um, the Seven Sons folks in Roanoke are doing it. Um, Paul Brown is doing it. Um, White Oak Pastures. Um, Will Smith is, I believe that's his name, Will Smith, down there at White Oak Pastures in Afton, Georgia. Um, so there are quite a bit. Pastured lamb. Uh, of, of all the products we work with, grass-fed beef has the most availability. Uh, pastured lamb mm. is in great demand, and pastured pork is, is the hardest uh, to find. So, and there's, okay. there's a reason for that. The, the, <laughs> the work and effort required uh, corresponds to the product availability. Mm. Yeah, I hear you. Good. Other questions? So I'm sorry, Eric. We just could not hear you there. I really apologize for that, but just couldn't hear you. Um, other questions or comments from anybody else um, that that really ha has to do with this grazing 
and, and using forage for, for cattle. And, and by the way, that picture there, I think is a, is a nice picture to kind of wrap this up. Uh, beautiful, I believe it's probably a sunset at your place, uh, Monty, but uh, Avery, I believe you might have a question. Yeah, I was just wondering with a 60 inch corn, was there any uh, tonnage tests done on that? Like rather than grain yield to see if you did graze it or silage it, what you would get out of it? Uh, no, there was, there was no forage dry matter weights done on that. I really, uh, I, by observation, I don't know what it is, but um, I, I wouldn't think there'd be a lot of uh, forage weight difference. But I will say it gives you an opportunity in the forage to have, um, one of the main reasons we're doing it is to grow a cover crop on the floor. And uh, mm -hmm. to be able to go in and graze that, I was hoping we'd have enough of established in order to intergraze the sheep. So in other words, uh, we'd have the sheep out in the corn while the corn was still standing. And uh, old timers used to do that in order to clean up the weeds so they could, you know, take their pickers through uh, the corn. So it's not unheard of, but the sheep will eat the, the cover crops in there. And that was a, that was a goal. But if you're going to chop it, you know, you would certainly be able to provide uh, like the cow peas would climb the stalks. Um, there's other climbing beans you could use. And, you know, we had some Italian or um, annual ryegrass in there uh, that worked really well. That would basically, I would think it'd be a nice way to bump up the protein content of uh, corn silage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, what we yeah, were that's one of the up. reasons for, yeah, six, yeah, wide row corn is to try to, as long as the yields are really close, I think it's going to take off in some areas. Um, so it's just something to keep monitoring. There's, it's not that hard to do. That's one thing about it. It's not that hard to set it up. Uh, Ian has another question here. Monty, are there any other species, any common species that you would stay away from in grazing mixtures? Um, so I guess a principle to think about is the soil microbial community and a cow's rumen are very closely related. So mm -hmm. if you want something that's going to be persistent for soil armor, it's typically not very digestible for the cow. So mm -hmm. you want to keep that in mind, or if you want something that will break down readily in the soil, it'll also generally be uh, readily digestible to the cow. So typically rye or you know, sheep go everywhere, do everything cover crop is rather persistent. Uh, it tends to lignify, I think, pretty strongly once you go to head. And um, mm -hmm. the other thing we have with the rye with head is we had some inc incidents of pink eye caused by that. Uh, that so good. I would prefer uh, forage criticality uh, for sure for uh, rye uh, as much as possible. But I wouldn't stay away from it. I just would adjust the mixture ratio uh, accordingly. Or make sure that you graze it free head and Ryan just talked about hay some this year you know in the boot or just going out with a mower and mowing it so that it doesn't mm -hmm. go to head and, and regrows tenderly so but as far as anything to stay away from I, I don't think there's anything to stay away from it's a matter of just you know knowing your timing you know, the millet was great until it went to went to head, and now it's just standing straw that they're, I'm watching them just eat right around it right now, but the brassicas they love. Mm -hmm. uh, Earlier here, they like the yeah. brassicas, so it's just a matter of staging yeah. your timing and planning. Yeah, Ian has a follow-up question about vetch. Uh, here there could be, may need be, to be some care if you plant uh, vetches in the grazing situation. I am not familiar with that. Ryan may be familiar with that. I, uh, I, am, I am not aware of that. Uh, typically, the vetch concentration is not much because of the, you know, 10 and 12 weight mixes. That may be, you know, saving us, but I would need to look into that a little bit. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have not heard uh, a caution on uh, vetch, but... I would say if you are doing, uh, and most people aren't, but 
I would use very very much caution if you were planting it by itself as a mono cover crop uh, because it's pretty it's it's pretty um, it's pretty uh, high protein and so forth and, and I, I think some cattle would get to it too much of it. but you know what's interesting is hairy vetch was a very common high protein source before alfalfa came along and uh, that's kind of interesting to know that because uh, there are some similarities there in in the forage value so uh, also also wondering yeah, how hairy, we're going to uh, control the hairy vetch over time too it's uh, it's persistent so <laughs> uh, one of our fears, hairy vetch is persistent <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, yes, hairy vetch is persistent, uh, being that it has a hard seed that generally when you plant a hairy vetch, uh, three to five percent, sometimes even more, will not grow for one or two years. Uh, I make the comment, uh, to your point, Monty, that if you ever plant hairy vetch, you might as well put it on the deed to your farm. <clears throat> now, from my perspective, I've had hairy vetch in every single field, and yes, you could probably find a hairy vet seedling in every single field every year if you look hard for it. I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a benefit. We just manage it around it. One thing I will say, if you do grow small grains and you don't spray uh, herbicides, you will be spraying herbicides or, the, or you'll see the vetch come up there because the, the, the timing is just perfect uh, to match the vetch. So that would be the caution. If you're growing small grains, uh, you definitely it'll it'll come up with that. So it's it's just a good thing to point out. Well, um, this has been great. Uh, I'll entertain another question or two if there is one. I'll just say that next uh, week I'm going to maybe mix it up a little bit. Could be a little controversial, uh, but I'm going to tell you why I no longer plant greedy beans. And you may wonder what are greedy beans. Uh, we've kind of termed that affectionately to double crop soybeans. Uh, there are parts of the country where uh, it's kind of borderline if you should or not, depends on your growing season, like after small grains. And there's areas where they're definitely more accommodating, but where I live in southeastern Pennsylvania, probably a strong 80% of small grains is planted to double crop beans or greedy beans, but I'm going to share why I no longer do that. Um, and, and again, in spite of the title, I'm not saying this is for everyone, uh, but it's, I'll explain to you uh, kind of the pros and cons. And I have done quite a bit of research. Actually, what you see in the background, that picture is a replication on small scale of basically cover crops slash forage versus double crop soybeans. I've done quite a few years uh, of that. And so I do have some experience uh, behind of what I'm doing there in my management techniques on my own farm right now. So I'll just uh, give a few more minutes. Our time is about up and you've had great questions. But anyone else have any comments or questions for Monty uh, or any other cover crop question you've been kind of musing about in the past week or so? Any questions at all? One thing in regards to your greedy beans, Steve, is uh, yeah. where we double crop beans versus the summer forage um, mix mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, both both fields, the floor was bare, um, just from okay uh, microbial activity and worm activity. Um, mm -hmm. Even that even that no-till picture that I had right there. Um, where we no till mm -hmm. the corn into that summer grazing mix, the uh, floor was mm -hmm. was pretty yeah. much there too. So we're when we when we create these diverse microbial systems that are that are working hard, we need to feed them. And mm -hmm. uh, boy, biomass right. is is a key. And um, we're struggling. Well, it's it's a moving target. We it's a, well, it's a moving. Yep, it's a moving target. And as you get into the system, you need to change. Uh, you'll change your species, the CDN ratios, and all that, and um, that's a, certainly another topic for a webinar right there. But it's cer certainly something I learned uh, over time, and uh, you know how to adjust. It's a part of 
creating a mix and, and what the ratios are, legumes versus uh, cereals and seed end ratios, maturity of termination, all these things that enter in in uh, fine tuning your management. So um, good case in point. So uh, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much, Monty. I really appreciate it. Your expertise, your insights, your experience is very helpful. I feel like I learned some things. Um, I, I'm, we are talking about some sort of cattle here. Uh, Monty just put up on the screen a live, live uh, feature right there of, of his cattle happily eating his cover crops. So thank you so much, Monty. Any parting comments? Well, I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody uh, that joined us today. I look forward to seeing you next week and uh, just have a fantastic week in the meantime. I'll see you. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Well, I will say one thing I, 